Well, we want to welcome you tonight to our Wednesday night Bible study. We want to welcome those of you that are looking in on Facebook. And the reason why we don't start exactly at 7 is because we have songs and your song leader does not want the whole world to know how he sings. And then we also do prayer requests, but then we move into the Word of God. So we are starting a new book tonight. We finished up Philippians. And we took our time with it because it is such a good book. We're going to do the same thing with the book of Colossians. It'll take us throughout the summer. So we hope that you will stay with us throughout the summer months. Awana will be over next week. The week following that, we will start Vacation Bible School. So please do not take the whole summer off. You had a whole year off already. All right, pandemic. And everybody was saying, we want to get back to church. Well, we're up and running. We need you to stay with us throughout the summer months. So bring your children to Vacation Bible School. And then come in here and hear the Word of God, the book of Colossians. And we will probably be in this book throughout the summer months. So we're going to look at the first seven verses tonight. The theme of the first seven verses very appropriately is the gospel the good news of Jesus Christ. What is the gospel? It's good news. It's good news. And it's only good news if you know the bad news. What's the bad news? You're a sinner under the wrath of God awaiting eternal punishment. That's the bad news. You're a sinner under the wrath of God awaiting eternal punishment. Pretty bad. But what's the good news? The good news is, is that you can be saved from the wrath of God. That you can have a righteous relationship with God through Jesus Christ. So we're going to look at the gospel tonight. First of all, the servants of the gospel. Colossians chapter 1 verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother. Stop right there. Paul calls himself an apostle. What is an apostle? Apostle is the name, the technical name for the 12 chosen by Jesus Christ to represent him and to carry on once he ascended back into heaven. Paul is an apostle. Now, how did Paul become an apostle? Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. Paul was chosen. Why was he chosen? Because of his education, because of his faithfulness. Because of his love for God? Why was Paul chosen? None of those things. He was chosen by the sovereign will of God. Why were you chosen? Now you're not an apostle. You know that. But you're a believer in Jesus Christ. How did that happen? The will of God. It wasn't you, it was all him. The will of God. The sovereign Providential 
will of God, chose Paul to be an apostle, and chose you to be a Christian. He chose you by the will of God. Now let's look. Say, I don't believe you, Pastor. Well, look at chapter 9 of Acts. Acts chapter 9. Let's go all the way back to when it happened. When Paul was chosen. Was Paul a follower of Christ? Was he sympathetic to the cause of Christ? No. Quite the opposite. Now, Saul, he wasn't even named Paul yet. He was Saul. Still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. Went to the high priest and asked for letters from him to the synagogues at Damascus. So that if he found any belonging to the way, that's the old name of the church, the way, both men and women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. So, Paul, who used to be Saul, public enemy number one of the Christian church. He hated the church. He was breathing threats and murder against the disciples. How many people did Paul murder? Well, we don't know, but he was responsible, whether he did it personally or he was responsible for arresting them and then they would be murdered. Paul made a lot of widows and a lot of orphans. He hated the Christian church. And then something dramatic happened. Something dramatic happened. Verse 3. As he was traveling, it happened that he was approaching Damascus. And suddenly, a light from heaven flashed around him. And he fell to the ground. And heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I'm Jesus whom you're persecuting. But get up into the city. It'll be told you what you must do. Verse 15. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the sons of Israel. He's a chosen instrument of mine. Now how did all this happen? Saul was heading to Damascus trying to arrest Christians. He was confronted by the resurrected Christ who saved him and chose him and appointed him to be a chosen instrument. How did all that happen? God's elective purpose. That's what he means in Colossians when he says he's an apostle. By the will of God. By the will of God. God chose him. Not based on anything he was or he did. He was an enemy. And yet... God overcame all that and chose him. Just like he chose you. You weren't hungry for God. You weren't seeking for God. You weren't crying out to God. He intervened. He invaded. He came into your life and chose you. To God be the glory. Now, Paul's an apostle. Now, we live in a day and age where many churches believe there are still apostles. Lots of churches believe there are still apostles today. We do not. We don't believe that there are any apostles today. Let me just give you a really brief little Bible study. Three marks of an apostle. 
First of all, an apostle had to personally witness the resurrection of Christ. Who can claim that today? No one. Christ was resurrected how many years ago? 2,000 years ago. You weren't born. How could you be an apostle? 1 Corinthians 15. Verse 5. The first mark of a true apostle... You had to personally witness the resurrection of Christ. 1 Corinthians 15, 5. And that he appeared to Cephas. That's Peter. Then to the twelve. After that he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time. Most of whom remain until now. But some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James. These are post-resurrection appearances. He appeared to James, then to all the apostles. And last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared to me also. For I am the least of the apostles, and not fit to be called an apostle. Because I persecuted the church of God. Paul was an eyewitness of the resurrected Christ. Who appeared to him on the road to Damascus. So all the apostles witnessed his resurrection. Now here's another mark of a true apostle you had to have been chosen directly by the Lord Jesus Christ Luke chapter 6 Luke 6 verse 12 you had to have been chosen by the Lord Luke 6 12 it was at this time that he went off to the mountain to pray and he spent the whole night in prayer to God. And when day came, he called his disciples to him. He had a lot of disciples. And he chose 12 of them. Out of the multitudes of disciples, he chose 12, whom he also named as apostles. Simon, whom he also named Peter. Andrew, his brother, James and John, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, the son of Alphaeus, Simon, who was called the Zealot, Judas, the son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who became a traitor. So he chose 12 of them. Later on, he chooses Paul. They were personally chosen by the Lord. Now here's another third mark of a true apostle. 2 Corinthians chapter 12 verse 12. 2 Corinthians 12:12. 12, 12, the signs of a true apostle were performed among you. With all perseverance by signs and wonders and miracles. The apostles had the ability to perform miracles. They raised the dead. They healed the sick. They performed miracles. So these are three marks of a true apostle. So how about all the people today that say they're apostles? Well, they don't, they, they don't, they, they were not there to visually see the resurrected Christ. Check that off. They were not personally chosen by the Lord. Check that off. And they can't do miracles. They think they can, but can they really? If there were some really miracle working apostles, they could have really demonstrated their power over the pandemic right they could add a lot of sick people to heal but they couldn't because they're not apostles 
They're just inflated, deceived people that think they're apostles. So, back in Colossians, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God and Timothy, our brother, the servants of the gospel, and then the people of the gospel. Look at verse 2. To all the saints and faithful brethren in Christ who are at Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father. To all the saints. Now, saints. Plural. Saints. Hagias. Used 67 times in the New Testament. Always in the plural sense. More than one. Saints mean the conse consecrated to God. Holy. It's a group of people set apart for the Lord and His kingdom. Saints. That's who you and I are. We are the holy ones. Holy in standing. Holy by virtue of our relationship with Jesus Christ. We have been set apart for the Lord Jesus Christ in His kingdom. We are the living saints. The Bible does not speak about dead saints that you pray to. We are not like the Roman Catholics that believe in the Santos. Saint Christopher. As a kid I recall we had a Saint Christopher on our dashboard. A magnet to keep us safe. I think it was Christopher. <clears throat> it's about the only saint we ever had. No, we don't, we don't pray to dead saints. We are the living saints. We are the saints. So, you are a saint. I don't feel like a saint. I'm not a holy one. You are in standing. Legally. Think about it as a legal thing. Legally you are justified. Justification is a legal term. You are declared by the judge to be righteous. Because you share and bear the righteousness of Christ. Legally you are righteous. Practically you may not be. You know we all sin. The goal of the Christian life is to become in practice what we are in position. So we are righteous legally. And we have to get ourselves practically in line with who we are. I guess you could make a nice t-shirt. Be who you are. Who are you? You're a saint. Become what you are. Be what you are. You're a saint. Live like one. Holy. Set apart under the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the subject, the object, the main, the main person of the gospel. Verse 4. Colossians 1.4. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love which you have for all the saints. That's the heart of the gospel. That's the major tenet of the gospel. Faith in Christ Jesus. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus. You put your faith in Christ Jesus. Resulting in, so how do I know if I'm truly saved? How do I know if I have real saving faith? Well, here's one result of true faith. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus, how do I know? Here, here's a good indicator that you're truly saved. And the love which you have for all the saints. Do you love the saints? 
Now you know who the saints are now. Other believers. Do you love them? Now I hate them. Well, if you hate the saints, you're probably not a true believer. Because if you really have faith in Christ Jesus, it will result and produce love for all the saints. The nice ones? Yes. They're easy to love. How about the honorary ones? Them too. Them too. The Lord puts those kind in your life to test you. How are you going to deal with them? You got to love them. Your love which you have for all the saints. That's the result of faith in Christ Jesus. Your love for all the saints. Now I'm thinking about our sister Nadine who's probably listening to us right now from Texas because her daughter's right down here. She has love for saints. She calls. She stays in contact with us and with the prayer group and with other friends that she has here because she has a love for the saints in this church and she's developing a love for the saints in her new church. You can have love for saints all over the place. <clears throat> That's the indicator you're truly saved. Love the saints. Love the saints. The object of the gospel. Faith in Jesus Christ, which produces love for the saints. Now, the assurance of the gospel. Look at verse 5. Because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. How do I really know it's true? You ever think like that? How do I really know this whole gospel thing is true? How do I really know I'm going to heaven? How do I really know there is a heaven? Maybe it's all a big hoax. How do I really know? Right here. Because of the hope laid up for you in heaven, of which you previously heard in the word of truth. The word of truth. What is truth? Where can you find truth? Right here in the word of God. This is the word of truth. You place your eternal destiny in the hands of the word of truth. It's not the word of lies, the word of deceit. It's not fake truth. It is true truth. It's the word of truth. The word of truth tells you, you have hope laid up for you in heaven. That's where you're going. That's where you long to be. That's your real destiny. Heaven. Heaven is a beautiful place. Defies description. And you have the hope laid up for you in heaven. You heard of it, it says, in the word of truth. The word of truth. You know, people today are very skeptical. They don't believe anybody. They don't believe the media because they've been lied to. They don't believe politicians because once they get elected, they vote totally contrary. They have a hard time believing anybody today. Who are you going to believe? Believe the word of truth. Stake your life upon it. The word of truth says you have a hope laid up for you in heaven. In heaven. Here's a great verse in 1 Peter. A parallel passage in 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 3. 1 Peter 1 verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to His great mercy has caused us to be born again. Who caused you to be born again? 
Who was the instrumental cause in you being born again? He caused you to be born again. And I'm glad he gets the credit because if I am the cause of myself being born again, then I could lose it. I could lose my born again status, but it didn't start for me in the first place. He caused me to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to obtain an inheritance an inheritance <clears throat> to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away reserved in heaven for you. You've got a reservation in heaven. That should get you excited. There's a reservation in heaven. And when you get there, somebody else is not sitting in your seats. You got a reservation there. How do you know it's true? Verse 5. Who are protected by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. You're protected by the power of God. Your reservation is sealed. You have an inheritance. It cannot be taken away. You're going to heaven someday. When your work on earth is done, when it's the right time according to God's timetable, He's going to take you to heaven. That's why for Christians, funerals are kind of sad, but not like unbelievers. Because you know that your loved one, who demonstrated all the fruits of the Spirit, who you know is saved, they're in heaven. They're in heaven. Paul says, absent from the body at home with the Lord. As soon as you leave this body, absent from the body, that's clinical death. Absent from the body, at home with the Lord. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, He will usher you into the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. The assurance of the gospel. Now, the spread of the gospel. Colossians 1.6 which has come to you just as in all, which has come to you, you Colossians, the gospel came to you. By the way, how did it come to the Colossians? Probably when Paul was in Philippi, the city of Colossians was about 70 miles away. Paul trained Epaphras. Epaphras planted the gospel seed in Colossians. That's probably the way it happened. And that's what it says right here. Which has come to you just as in all the world. Also, it is constantly bearing fruit and increasing. The spread of the gospel. You see, the gospel is not just a stagnant system of ethics. The gospel is living, moving, growing force, a reality. It spreads. It's an organic force that it spreads. It spread throughout the whole world. It started in Jerusalem with Jesus. And he went to heaven and the 12 apostles took over. And they passed the baton on and on and on and on all the way down to where we are today. And the gospel has spread throughout the whole world. You can go everywhere in this world and you will encounter other saints. Because the gospel, it spreads. It came to you. It's constantly bearing fruit and increasing. It's like, it's like seed. When you look at seed, it looks like just dead little pieces of nothing. Put them into the ground and it grows. There's life 
in the seed. <coughs> we don't comprehend how it works. But put those little light, they look like lifeless little dry things, but they're seed. They contain life. Put them in the ground and watch them grow. The spread of the gospel. Why does it spread? Because it's living. It's living. Another aspect of it spreading. Just as it's constantly bearing fruit and increasing even as it has been doing in you since the day you heard of it. So here it is. The gospel spreads throughout the world. But in another sense, the gospel increases in you. The gospel increases in the world, but the gospel also increases in you. How does that work? That's what it says right here. That's what, let's read it again, verse 6. Which has come to you just as in all the world, constantly bearing fruit and increasing, even as it has been doing in you since the day you heard of it. So the gospel increases in you. What does that mean? That means that you continue growing as a child of God. You don't stay stagnant either. You continue growing. You continue growing because the gospel has power. Now, real quickly, how do you grow? How do you grow? Well, three ways. There are others, but let me just give you three real brief. First Peter 2.2. 2. How does the gospel increase in your life? First Peter 2.2. 2. Like newborn babies. Have you had one of those lately? Nobody has. I think, Christine, you're the closest one to it. Although it's not newborn anymore. Like newborn babies. Long for the pure milk of the word. <coughs> Ever try giving a breastfed baby a pacifier? They spit it out because they know it's fake. What do they want? They want the pure milk of the word so that by it you may grow in respect to salvation. So how do you grow? How do you increase in respect to salvation? The pure milk of the word. You need the Word of God. You need the Word of God. You can't grow without the Word of God. It's your spiritual sustenance. It's your vitamin. You need the Word of God just like you eat three times a day plus a snack. <clears throat> Maybe two. Your spirit needs the Word of God. You need it so you can grow. You can't grow without the Word of God. Here's another, Psalm chapter 1, verse 1, how to grow, the book of Psalms 1, verse 1, how to grow, well you need the milk, the word of God, and then you need this, Psalm 1, verse 1, Psalm chapter 1, verse 1, how blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. He removes himself from these kinds of people. Wicked people, sinful people, scoffers. He doesn't stand in their, pay, in their way. He doesn't sit in their seat. He doesn't hang out with them. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He will be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in its season. Whatever he does, he prospers. So how do you grow? Very careful with the company you keep. If you hang out with nothing but sinners and scoffers and wicked, 
you're going to become contaminated. It's going to affect you. You will become like them. So, how to grow. Pure milk of the word. Be careful who you hang out with. And Ephesians 4. Here's another one. Ephesians 4. Verse 15. Ephesians 4, 15. But speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into Him who is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body, being fitted and held together by that which every joint supplies, according to the proper working of each individual part, causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. You got to be part of the body. You got to be part of the body, the body of Christ, the church. Remove yourself from the church, you will not grow. Because you're just one part of the overall body, you need to be part of a body of believers. So that's how to grow. Now we're going to finish off here in Colossians 1 verse 6, the latter part of the verse. The, the grace of the gospel, Colossians 1 verse 6, the end of the verse, the, the very end of the verse, it's been increasing even as it's been doing in you since the day you heard of it and understood the grace of God in truth. The grace of God. Grace is in contrast to all the other false gospels that are based on works. The true gospel is based on grace. It's the grace of God. The grace of God. And then finally, the messenger of the gospel, verse 7, just as you learned it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow bondservant, who is a faithful servant of Christ on our behalf. He also informed us of your love in the Spirit. Epaphras took the gospel, probably from Philippi to Colossae. Paul sent him and he started the church there in Colossians. And he is the beloved brother, the messenger of the gospel. Our hope and prayer is that the gospel will be increasing in you, deep inside you, through the ministry of the Word of God, through godly friends that you surround yourself with, and through being plugged into a local church, allowing the gospel to permeate and to increase in your life. Let us bow in a word of prayer. We'll invite our usher forward. <clears throat> Father, thank you for the gospel. Help us, Lord, to be consumed with it, enamored with it, fascinated by it. Help us, Lord, to strive to understand it and to make it known to other people. Help us, Lord, to broadcast the gospel seed which contains life to people in our life. And now we pray you would bless this evening's offering in Jesus' name. Amen.